that this place is um, the kind of purpose in some way to promote the SDGs from the social sector and the private sector. That is to say, while our governments have our own voluntary national reviews or BNRs, just like any other government, uh, but actually um, most of the SDGs, as you well know, uh, is implemented from the private and social sector. And so how to coordinate the private and social sector's work so that they don't work at odds with each other, but rather um, work together as a effective partnership that is our main work here. And so, um, as the digital minister, of course, I prefer to uh, use digital tools. Uh, and so, please pardon the projections, <laughs> and um, we'll see uh, how, how well that goes. Right, so, um, our president, uh, when she became our president uh, around three years ago now, um, she said a very inspiring statement. She said, before, when we think of democracy, we think of education, uh, uh, position between opposing values. But now, when we think of uh, democracy, we must think about conversation between diverse set of values. And before the sustainable development goals um, back in the battle days, uh, many people would think that, uh, for example, economic development on one side and uh, environmental protection on the other, and climate change and so on, are kind of at odds with each other. And from the uh, public sector's view, it's like our uh, ministers, uh, for example, the Minister of Economy uh, is like the naughty on the left side, and the Minister of uh, Environment, for example, is like the not on the other side. Uh, and so they have to answer to their different stakeholders and also, uh, you know, absorb all the tensions. Whereas our public service in the middle is anonymous, but absorb all the tensions, which is a really bad way. Um, but um, that kind of went bankrupt uh, when we became the age of mobile computing and social media, because uh, it used to be that people need MDs and ministry to assemble. But nowadays, anyone, right, who, who make a strike, um, you know, uh, on Fridays, on the middle of nowhere, uh, schools or whatever, um, can launch a, a climate change campaign and, on Twitter, which you're all very familiar with, I'm sure, uh, and, and things like that. And so we, we see organizers out of nowhere, and that can organize thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and if we keep adding one knot, that is to say one agency, to each emerging topic, we will run out of agencies, and also we will um, not be able to arbitrate between any of those emerging issues anyway, because they're all structural and they all are related to each other. And so in the social innovation lab, what we're building toward is that, is that we're asking a different set of questions. Here we ask, we have people of different positions, but do we have some common values that can build on each other? And if we have established some common values, can we deliver innovations that uh, follow those values and leave no one was off? And so that is the idea of the so-called triple present line. That is to say, when we work, we work simultaneously toward the economic and social and the environment goals. And so I'll just use two examples to illustrate and then it's open to the floor for questions. Um, every year, our president organized a presidential hackathon. And so this year's theme is called Enabling Sustainable Infrastructure. Um, when you think of hackathon, maybe many of you think of a two-day event or three-day event, like a marathon. Nobody sleeps for 48 hours and goes something up. But uh, the presidential hackathon is special. It's actually three months of co-creation process. It's a set of hackathons, basically. Um, and every year, we crowdsource that is to say we ask from the crowd, um, what are the ideas that you think that the president has promised but haven't fully delivered and then we can do better. And so uh, every year we get hundreds of those ideas. And uh, after a three months co-creation process, we do two things. First, we make sure that each team becomes trilingual in the sense that each team has at least one data and tech expert, one domain expert, and one regulation expert, uh, usually a public servant. Uh, and so these three people together figure out a feasible solution that has a chance of integrating back to the civil service. And that is what we, we call the proof of concept stage, which takes three months, case in point. Uh, one of the five main teams uh, last year is called Water Saviors. It's a plenty of seed that saves water. And so basically, um, these are the workers in the Taiwan Water Corporation who maintain the world's longest uh, water pipes, many of them plastic. And so water leakage is a real problem that was constantly with the risk of water shortage. And so they have to send those uh, masters, um, skill workers, uh, with the hearing aids uh, to, to listen to the potential pipe leaks and to fix them. But it's not very effective. Like once there's a new leak, it takes on average one year for it to be discovered by these people. And so the Taiwan Water Corporation says we have a lot of data, like SCADA data, uh, pressure data, water flow data, and things like that. 
but we really need the machine learning experts. We are the domain experts, but we need the machine learning experts, and we need the regulatory experts to make sure that we can integrate it into our um, daily workflow without compromising people's privacy and things like that. And so after three months, they co-created a, a bot, a like WhatsApp bot, um, that can talk to those repair person uh, whenever they wake up, uh, they geolocate where they are and say, you know, um, these are the three most likely to leave places near you that you can uh, visit first. And so it increased their, um, you know, job um, satisfaction because they spend most of the time on things that are actually requires creative thinking. And although the accuracy is to 70%, they still saves massively amount of time. And because we announced to the world that we are solving the system with one goals, this particular one is 6.4, right? And so everybody else discovers it. And so New Zealand, after they won the presidential hackathon, um, one of the five teams invited them over to Wellington to solve a very similar problem because they didn't used to have a water shortage problem, but now they do because of climate change. And so they also successfully um, narrowed down the uh, water leakage detection. So this is just one of the examples of how it can help um, these uh, innovative solutions. But the um, point here is that the winning teams, they don't receive any prize money. They, they don't receive any um, payments because they have to have public servant in it, right? They're not in it for money. Instead, the five winning teams out of hundreds of media um, gets a trophy. And a trophy handed by the president herself is a projector that when turned on, projects the president handing that trophy to the team. Uh, <laughs> very made up, you um, but, but this is very useful in internal negotiation. <laughs> Most of the time, uh, the public servants actually really want this to be implemented, but they don't have the political will, they don't have the budget, they don't have the communication, they don't have the data um, communication um, you know, standards and things like that. But basically, this signifies the presidential promise that says, after three months of this group concept, we do nine months of um, a presidential will. We do whatever it takes to adjust any number of regulations, to allocate any number of budget to make your proof of concept into everyday public service. So maximizing impact is actually the, the trophy and what it signifies. And this is basically what we mean by data collaboratives. Um, it means that when we say open data in Taiwan, we don't just mean open government data. We actually mean um, open citizen data as well. And so like in Taiwan, we have a lot of people caring about air quality. So they build a lot of air boxes. Um, and they are all under 100 euros. And people deploy them uh, on their balcony, on their schools, and things like that. But it's not just measuring for themselves. They actually upload it to a public um, like uh, distributed ledger, also known as blockchain by the domain standard. A distributed ledger uh, that uh, makes sure that nobody can mutate each other's data, and people can trust each other. And because of that, uh, the government people and the civil society people and the private sector can collaborate. And you can, at a glance, see what the you know digital gap is like in Taiwan, or what the air quality is like. In Taiwan, and where there is a digital gap, uh, we actually step in and also um, make sure that the local people's need, like the industrial parks, or even uh, on the north of Pescador Island, where we are building the renewable uh, wind turbines and things like that, actually has airbox measurement devices in it, so that we can collaborate on getting um, to the bottom of how those um, data comes from and also how the um, air quality is affected. So this is again is the SDG. The 1718 enhanced reliability of the local data. And now, this year we have a record number of applicants to the um, presidential hackathon. Uh, this is the final 20 teams. Um, the great thing about SDG is that they have a lot of you know, pretty icons. So you can in the class see uh, um, the teams care about, for example, you know, good health and well being, about health coverage, about um, combat organized crime and illicit financial flow. Uh, strengths and resilience, adaptive capacity, and um, inclusive and sustainable urbanization by way of reporting uh, of illegal parking, actually, um, and um, reduce marine pollution by building models of marine plastic waste and maybe recycle them back into a fuel or things like that. And so all these are very creative and innovative, of course. But how do we actually pick 20 teams out of the hundreds of teams? We use a very innovative way of voting called quadratic voting. Have, have anyone heard of quadratic voting? No, they. That's great. So I guess you spent 30 minutes pitching. So it's a, it's a um, new voting mechanism invented uh, by Glenn Weil uh, and Vitalik Buterin, uh, you know, the Ethereum guy. Uh, and so basically the idea is that everybody gets 99 points and you have uh, 100 or so, 100 or 
so cases. Now you can vote 99 uh, votes on each of the 99 that you like, because one vote is just one point. But if you want to really express your preference and vote two votes on any project, that two vote would cost you four points. Three votes cost nine points, four votes, um, 16 points, and so on. So basically, if you have 99 points, you can only vote nine votes on one if you really care very strongly, and you still have some points to spare that you have to distribute. So basically, it's a way to make sure that your um, marginal uh, preference strength is reflective of um, the uh, strengths of the points that you want to spend. And that is how we can get people review the, the private information that is actually how really they care about um, those items. And so we get more than 2,000 people participating in this QB experiment. It's the first in the world. And they really produce a very um, nuanced set of synergistic um, teams. Because when you have 99 points, instead of voting 9 votes on 1, you tend to think, oh, I can vote 7 on this and 7 on the other. And you tend to choose the two that makes no sense of uh, synergistically. So it's a uh, social innovation in itself that makes sure that people vote uh, on, on cohorts that work very well together. And so this is our team that we're curating now. And so after each of these team become a, a sustainable, um, either public policy or a social enterprise or things like that, uh, we also have a uh, listing SI that I want, GOVTW, SI stands for social innovation. Now this is a um, national wide uh, website. Uh, basically, we have one for each of the major um, uh, directions of the president. If you want to know about Taiwan's AI strategy, it's AI Taiwan GOVTW. If it's the CIVO IOC collective intelligence, it is CI Taiwan GOVTW. The smart Taiwan is smart Taiwan GOVTW and so on. So it's very easy to remember and, and it can aggregate from the every level of the government without uh, actually people, you know, um, fighting over each other's domain names. And it's basically a concerted SEO. So basically when you're on the SI directory, people show that uh, which county and which city, you know, which is sustainable goals that they're focusing on. And once you're clicking into it, you can see the registered um, SDG-oriented uh, enterprises and social sector and even academia that cares about these topics. And again, so this is uh, target 17 six. So how do we actually curate those 300 or so uh, social innovation organizations? I actually tour around Taiwan. And so um, I go to the rural places, indigenous places, remote islands, and so on, and have a real um, you know, multi-stakeholder talk to get people's um, idea about how to revitalize uh, their county and so on. But the point here is that in Taiwan, we have broadband as human right. Uh, so not just internet as human right, but broadband as human right. So anywhere in Taiwan, if you don't have 10 megabits per second, it's my fault, you can talk to me. Uh, and so because of that, where, wherever uh, I come, uh, there is sufficient bandwidth to connect with the social innovation lab, which is right here. So basically, the 12 ministries related to social innovation, they sit where you sit every couple of weeks or so, uh, while I tour around Taiwan, and they meet through two-way teleconference, how the local people really think about the national development agenda, how to revitalize their um, counties and things like that. And so the Ministry of Interior, for example, uh, it used to be in the battle days that they uh, receive a request and they say, oh, I have to talk with the Ministry of Health and Welfare, I have to talk with the Ministry of Economy Affairs and I'll talk to other ministries. But now, because those ministries are literally sitting next to each other, they can't do that anymore. They have to brainstorm and deliver a solution right there because I'm a radically transparent uh, minister. Like this talk is being videotaped and will be on YouTube uh, before the end of the day. And uh, actually, every single meeting that I chair, including those regional tour meetings, um, we have the entire transcript online. So you can see that I have talked to almost 4,000 people um, over. To Almost 200,000 speeches um, when, like, after I become the digital minister. And, and so, this is not just a um, summary of the meeting, this is actually the meeting itself. Like, you can actually be the digital minister if you have time <laughs> to go through my, my daily work. Uh, and so, each and every sentence has its own URL. You can quote it on social media, you can become a social object and, and talk about this. And so, because of this radical transparency, um, these uh, social uh, workers and the public servants, they are very much in tune with each other because nobody wants to sound unprofessional when they know that they will be 
public for you to transcribe after 10 days of editing, of course. And so if the public servants um, deliver innovation in the battle days, um, the minister always gets credit. And if things go wrong, they always get a blame. And it's not a fair deal for them. But now with regular transparency, everybody knows who is the original proposal, the career public service, that proposed this innovative idea and formed it in a collaborative. So they always get credit. But as far as I know, only I'm doing this. And so if things go wrong, it's always you can blame Audrey. And so because of that, <laughs> I basically, it's like presidential hackathon, right? We absorb all the risk and have the public service get all the credit. And so because of that, they can get into the habit of experimenting and ensure responsive, inclusive, and representative decision making that is informed by the lived experience of, of everyday people. So that, again, is a uh, open government goal, is uh, SDG 16.7. So in conclusion, basically, we're not just focusing on one or two SDGs, but we're building a new culture where the people from the social private and public sector can work together to form data collaboratives and basically using the reliable data on distributed ledgers to build effective partnerships and enable this open sharing. And so uh, I've been, I'm being digital minister for two and a half years now. Two and a half years ago when I became the digital minister, because it's a new position, let's say, um, our HR asked me to write a job description so that they can explain to the people what this digital minister actually means. And so uh, because I'm also a poet, I call myself a politician, and, and so I uh, wrote a poem as my job description. So I'm going to read it to you, and then uh, it's question time. So my job description follows. Um, when we see the Internet of Things, let's make it a Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. predetermined which data sets will be released yeah. by the government or whoever produces the data sets. Like anything we collect, we release. Okay, so uh, I was going to ask about the policies about which data sets to release. And also, um, the other the other side of it is that even when data sets are available, um, there's a necessary level of skills required to leverage them, to analyze them, to act on them, and so on. That's right. And so I was just wondering like, um, how you guys are addressing all of that. Sure, sure. That is a great question. So basically, our, our um, open data regulation is built on our FOIA, uh, just like many other countries, freedom of information access. So in our FOIA law, that basically says uh, the government should proactively make available information uh, as they are collecting it, but only, of course, statistics and also on things that are unrelated to privacy, because we don't see private data and open data as any overlap. Okay, so if you trust your data, for example, healthcare or whatever, uh, to a government agency, it's a fiduciary relationship that basically uh, trusts the agency to act on your best interest. And we don't make that open data because that wouldn't be in your best interest, right? So we only make into open data the statistics of that. And so again, I think because our privacy law is uh, a European Union uh, style, uh, and we're also getting GDPR adequacy real time. So now, I think, uh, and so basically, we're firmly of the GDPR school of thought. That is to say, data is only an asset. It is a beginning of a relationship. If I trust my data to you, it begins a relationship where I can ask how well you're acting at my best interest, and I can, you know, have data portability and explainability, right? To deletion updates, you know, all, all the usual things. And so that is not the data, that is just data 
data as relationship. Now, what is open data is, as I said, the uh, air quality, water quality, earthquake prevention, all, all those different things, right? A river wouldn't say that you infringe on my privacy because they want, don't want to be measured and things like that. And so those environmental data, those baseline data, are the data that we collect as the uh, publish as soon as we collect. We don't have any restriction on that. We basically say any uh, government organizations, if they build a ICT system, when they're procuring, they have to treat um, APIs, that is to say, machine readability or metability, as a kind of accessibility requirement. So just as a website need to be accessible by blind people, a website also need to be accessible by Jason speaking people, right? And, and so it's the same clause in our procurement. That's the first thing I did as a digital minister is to change the procurement law to put open API into the same strength as our accessibility procurement. So if any vendor comes and say, oh, I only can produce you know, JPEG files or JPDF, and I cannot produce um, you know, JSON-based API or an API, they could be disqualified for unprofessionalism. And so that is how we're fixing uh, the data quality issue that you just mentioned. Now, once we have the best data, still it needs uh, to make a social impact. And that's where the presidential hackathon comes in. Because in a presidential hackathon, what we basically have is that people <coughs> highlighting the social issues and the data owners discover how they can use the data to help alleviate uh, those social issues. And once they form the data collaboratives in a cross sectoral way, basically we can see all the regulations that stand in the way of maximizing the impact of the data. So that's why they're covered by the uh, presidential hackathon case. If you're interested in the concrete steps that we've taken, there is a website um, called Data Collaboratives, data collaboratives.org um, that basically uh, shows uh, how we can create public value by exchanging data and how we can build partnerships. It, it is an international thing. So um, we are part of data collaboratives and we're part of crowd law, which is crowd law that covers the co-creation of regulations part. So if you um, you know search for crowd law and our data collaboratives, you can see the uh, more academic uh, part of how to make this work in a uh, researcher compatible fashion, so to speak. But it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Transparency at the root 
it doesn't mean that I set up a live stream on every meeting. It's not like that, right? Uh, and so the, the main point of regular transparency is to provide accountability. The accountability means that we can give an account of why a policy comes to be. Because in most of the countries, freedom of information law, it only publishes after a decision is made. But in a drafting stage, basically, um, nothing is open. Or, or if they're open, uh, you get a heavily redacted version. And you can't really piece out the context. But this is a squandering of the cognitive resource of public. Because if people know the why of policy making, if people can intervene at the very beginning, uh, just a second, at the very beginning, sorry, it's in Chinese, but um, in the very beginning of the double diamond process, if people can intervene here when we're still figuring out what to work on, when we're still asking how might we make things better, if people can fully understand this part, then they are actually much more um, motivated to read through the transcripts uh, and to uh, get their ideas out. Because if we're only opening up conversations on the implementation and delivery stage, then actually people, as you um, correctly mentioned, nobody really follows um, everything, right? And so only people who are stakeholders are likely to follow the conversations, uh, especially in the planning, that is to say, discover and define stages. And out to that is that the topic that we care about, as I say, the regional tour, is determined by the regional people. Or if I travel somewhere um, by e-petition, it is determined by 5,000 people petitioning for something. And so those 5,000 people will at least be interested in getting basically the e-signatures that they have uh, joined in the e-petition and follow it through to see whether their proposition actually became a public service. So we're not basically saying that everybody have to read everything. We're basically just saying when people go back to find who is the key person who um, are getting the innovative ideas out and so on, they can find the right person and they also talk to the right people to make sure that we meet in the middle, that is to say, to determine the how many questions to get up. So a radical transparency is just an instrument. It's not a goal in itself. The end goal is just to build trust. And I hope that answers some part of your question.
based on those data. So this is this year's theme. And there's a sub-theme of, of AI. So we're also inviting, say, OpenAI or DeepMind or whatever that can use the cutting edge machine learning algorithms to make sense of this like very complex auditing data. And so this is to, to uh, this year's theme and so thing. But if you're interested, um, every year we have a presidential hackathon. So any challenge sponsor that focuses on any of the other SDGs can apply to be our sponsor for the next year. Yeah, Yes. Thank you, Mark, very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, and it's a really interesting social innovation model. My uh, my question has to do with the link between socially innovative ideas and strategies and obtaining the resources to implement. Uh, so in any form of collective action, one of the things that either tends to, to reinforce and, and, and build broad-based social action is the experience of success. Uh, and, and that basically means going from ideas to actually being able to do something. Uh, so could you talk a bit about the link between social innovation and obtaining resources to implement these ideas? And certainly. So there's two kinds of resource, right? There's uh, the mobilization, right? The, the goodwill, the people who really want to try this out, uh, you know, going vegetarian once uh, per, per week or something like that. Vegetarian Friday or Vegetarian Monday, I think. That's the, the hip thing here in Asia. But <laughs> anyway, um, the other hip thing is uh, impossible pork. Uh, not impossible beef. <laughs> that's the other hip thing, thing here. But in, in, in any, any case, so one thing is mobilizing. And the other thing is mobilizing financial resources. And these two calls for different strategies, obviously. Um, in Taiwan, we have a really good crowdfunding culture that uh, basically makes sure that you can simultaneously get people and get money uh, for it. So here's the point. Uh, I'll just use one concrete example. Um, so here, um, you can see um, um, it is Okay. Right. So right outside, after this talk, uh, you can you can see a uh, modified wheelchair. So it used to be that in Taiwan, there's many places there's street vendors who are handicapped, who are on wheelchairs and vending basically, you know, these things, uh, tissue papers or chewing gums or whatever, at very low margin. Um, and so there was a social innovator about a couple of years ago that did a comprehensive market analysis on these street vendors. So not treating them as people who are disadvantaged, but treating them as vendors and did an analysis. And they found three pain points. First, not many people know where the money flows, right? So there, there's a lack of transparency. And uh, their interaction, their customer relationship management is so hard because every time they just say, sir or ma'am, I you know, just kind of do some kindness or whatever. But the next time you visit, they say the same thing. So it's not very good CRM. And also, they uh, don't have a really good uh, supply chain management. So um, their margin is low, and they don't sell those chewing gums at a uh, lower, price, uh, lower price than compared to other um, you know, uh, convenience stores and so on. And so what they did is basically a social collage. They make sure that they are partnered with people who do training, uh, like tool city tour guys and things like that, to make sure that they have good people skills. They work with uh, people who are very innovative designers to make those wheelchairs into mobile stations that are uh, kind of still charging, that can uh, you know, display a large LED, uh, sorry, LCD uh, board uh, advertisement that even hooks into infrared sensors so they know roughly how many people are in front of it and they can show uh, the advertisement accordingly. And then they also source like fair trade coffee and tea and indigenous um, you know, high margin uh, products for them to carry. But the point here is that they uh, even when they only have these paintings, which are from people with Down syndrome, by, by the way. So basically, people with prism and differences, Down syndrome, they, they paint things in a way that were very memorable because they look at the world in a geometric way. So a lot of design you see here in the social innovation lab, like this soccer field that used to be here, are from people with Down syndrome. So using these very memorable artwork, they launch a successful crowdfunding campaign. And they originally just you know, won a sub-million, but they very quickly raised a million. But more important than that, you can see that whenever people put money into it, they really wanted to succeed. 
So they also crowdsource ideas, like in places where there's no Wi-Fi, they can serve as Wi-Fi hotspot. Like if you're a tourist and your phone almost runs out of battery, this can be your fast charging station, but they can make you some coffee or tea that are fair trade. Uh, and they also observe that here you can have a lot of food and umbrella, so they can also be a community umbrella interchange center and things like that. But along the way, you can see that the CSR mindset became a business development mindset. People stop seeing these people as kind of disadvantaged people we need to help, but rather a very efficient last mile delivery for socially impactful products and services. And so by the end of the programming campaign, I can say that people's idea about these people have changed. And then that is the real social innovation we want to see. And so these are now uh, really operating uh, in Taipei City and things like that. And so this is just one example. But basically what I mean is that uh, we need to make it actionable, just like putting $5 to it uh, and connect it. That is to say, once we put $5 into it, I want to contribute an idea that makes me look good on my social media friends, right? And then it's extensible, so that it's not limited by the original vision, and, and it could be extended in every which way. And, and that's what open, open innovation means. It means that it gets replicated by other cities very quickly without patenting or uh, otherwise restricting the idea. So actionable, connected, extensible, I think is the way to mobilize the resources. Um, hello. Yeah. So my question is, how do you educate or create awareness among the public into, especially the ones that are not exactly remotely part of the industry or aware of what is happening in here? Um, to, to let them know that they have a voice or they could express their agreement into what social initiatives would be implemented. Okay, great question, yes. So, um, it's twofold. Um, first is we get the idea of social entrepreneurship into a lot of different ministries projects. Actually, um, as I'm the coordinator of the social innovation plan uh, in Taiwan, we're unique um, in, I think, most of the countries in that in our social innovation plan, there really is no uh, one owning uh, here, one owning ministry. I was just looking at an English version, but there's no English version, so you have to bear with me. Uh, so basically, um, of the social innovation plan that has the sustainable development goals as a top priority, uh, we have uh, the Minister of Education and Interior in charge of redesigning the curriculum, even K-12, <laughs> uh, making sure that sustainability is part of the K-12 curriculum. And then in the higher education, we make sure that university have their university social responsibility program, just like CSR, or we call it USR, so that people get uh, undergrad degrees by solving a local environmental social and economic problem in a way that's come on the SDGs. And I think that is very helpful because we observe when people in the senior line in the university, if they get their school credits by solving a local problem, when they move on to a higher education, like graduate studies, it's far more likely that they will choose to learn something that's relevant to their local social community. If they uh, learn something in a very abstract way, chances are that they'll just move out and lose connection with their local community. And so at the curriculum level is very important. And uh, of course the um, financial part, social financing and things like that, we mobilize all our long-term pension funds and things like that to basically do patient uh, investment um, things that have a provable um, you know, environmental and social governance uh, value. And we also do regulatory co-creation to make sure that if you're an innovator, everybody now gets the idea that you can go to this website called sandbox.org.pw and identify a outdated regulation that you want to abolish or amend or change and basically say, you know, I have a social innovation, the regulation didn't anticipate it, so how about let's just try our version of regulation for a year and see what happens. And so this is called sandbox. We see it in finance uh, industries in the UK and Singapore, right? But here in, in, in Taiwan, you easily see 12 ministries here. So we have a general purpose sandbox on the regulation level that anyone can apply for a one-year exemption. Um, so basically, there's a one-year semi-monopoly, but in exchange, you have to be open on your data, innovation, and things like that.
like that. So that if it doesn't work, um, we take the investors, but everybody else learns something and try a different angle. But if it does work, then your regulation become our regulation. So our regulators don't have to regulate something that we don't have first-hand experience of. And that massively erases the awareness of citizen participation because they don't have to wait for four years or two years to cast a vote. They can just propose a innovation on sandbox or GTW and just change the regulations just like that or through a petition that's another very popular way. And that is, again, uh, very popular. In Taiwan, there's 23 million people. Uh, about 5 million people have participated in the uh, e-participation platform, which is like one quarter of the, the population. Um, and, and now, uh, required by law to say a fine print that while you can challenge regulation of any ministries, you're not allowed to start experiments on money laundering or funding terrorism. These two are out of the question because we know what will happen. There's no need to experiment. But everything else is fair game. <laughs> right? and, and so I think that, and finally, I think uh, it's just a matter of getting um, the voice of people who cannot vote heard. Like uh, the most popular e-petitions in Taiwan are done usually by people who are 15 years old or 65 years old. These two groups of people have the most time on their hands uh, and, and care the most about public welfare, right? And, and so the 15 years old, for example, one of them petitioned almost two years ago to gradually ban all plastic uh, uh, straws or whatever uh, in uh, dining experience. And now if you go to McDonald's, Taiwan, you, they don't give you straws anymore. They, they uh, encourage you to just drink directly. And actually, our uh, environmental protection agency now has a plan starting this year to basically ban uh, non-recyclable straws uh, in indoor settings and gradually to outdoor settings as well. And it's all started by a 15 years old. And then she's basically just doing her civics class. And her teacher says, you know, find something that can mobilize people. And then she finds something that mobilizes people. So, which is a, a, a great story, but uh, that shows how even before the age of voting, they can mobilize people. And we found that people who are 15 years old reaches the most number of people. They really know how to do social media and things like that. And so that really gets the idea of social innovation and entrepreneurship out. And that is how we can collectively move 
people from the early stage solutions to the mature, to the impact scale solutions, because different organizational styles and different communities specialize in different stages in, in this impact route. And only by uniting these people under the same umbrella of social innovation organizations or societies, instead of some people calling a oh, the co-op movement, the word the B Corp movement, or the Unus movement, and things like that. They're still respectively their movements, but now they are all part of this umbrella as I O movement. So I think that is my
Thank you. Um, to, to ask you more about your, your two hats and the, the balance between those, um, as your government minister hat, or working with the government minister hat, um, how do you look at uh, sorry, understanding that the mission is uh, supporting social entrepreneurship and social innovation? Um, how do you look at the negative externalities that come with a lot of uh, home with industry in general and the, maybe the tech industry in particular? Sure. So, um, so there's the traditional um, industries um, like capital is unknown impact, um, which is code word for negative, uh, and, and that, that, that creates social and environmental challenges, right? That's, that's our main question. So um, in Taiwan, we're shifting uh, gradually, um, actually quickly enough, from uh, non-renewable energy to renewable energy, from uh, traditional high pollution industry to circular economy and things like that. So there's a general realization that we have to do things this way. But this realization only comes from a quantifiable negative externality. So that is my main way as digital minister, is just to make sure that people know exactly how bad it is for the environment. Hence, the citizens on air pollution measurement devices. Many, many different, uh, I went to many different UN SDG related uh, forums. People in Asia usually um, is very um, anxious about citizen science projects like that because they challenge the government's legitimacy. If you have a friend that measures the water quality and the EPA publish another number, of course you trust your friend's number, right? Even though we are of lesser precision. But in Taiwan, we really get the idea of we can't feed them, so we join them. So, so we set up things in like industrial parks because the citizen scientists cannot go into industrial parks uh, because they're private property and things like that. But the uh, labs there, are owned by the public sector. So we can hang the air boxes on top of the lamps and things like that. So that is how we get goodwill from the community. But even more importantly, that is how we prove to the capitalists that instead of with unknown impact, they're actually creating an active impact. And then we, of course, have ways in ESG accounting and things like that to make sure that these capitalists change their ways uh, in their report because we make sure that all publicly listed companies have to use uh, SDG compliant way to do reporting. I think over half of them do now. And so this is an accountability part. So I, I'm less concerned about the environmental challenge because this is really strong here. Now the social challenge is harder. The tech, the tech companies, uh, the semi-sovereign multinationals, um, basically sells addiction. Uh, and uh, use um, surveillance capitalism data as uh, concerns. And so the social externality that they create, the filter bubbles, loneliness, addiction, and things like that, they're much harder to quantify. And so what, uh, what I'm doing is twofold. First, that uh, I make sure that I, um, whenever I do a public speech on a university or whatever, I, I advocate the idea of a, um, a filter that is uh, actually, I would also recommend you to use, um, which is called Facebook Feed Eradicator. And this is just one of the, um, my favorite uh, ideas, but this one takes less time to explain, so I'll just use this one. Um, so basically, um, it eradicates um, the Facebook feed, uh, as it says on the tin, um, and it's on a live hacker, and, and so on. And so once you install the newsfeed um, eradicator, basically it's replaced your Facebook feed with a motivational uh, speech from Adler or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then um, what, what it does is that um, you can still use the other interesting parts of Facebook, which are pro-social, but the anti-social part, which is a parasitic AI, um, maximizing your time spending on it, is gone. And so because of that, people don't get addicted anymore. And so our relationship with Facebook is that we, we encourage them to uh, use the more benefit stakeholder or contributor solution. Part of it, there's part of that that are pro-social, but we also make sure that people are aware that there are negative psychological externalities uh, coming out of the use of social media. And we teach in K-12 uh, how the children themselves may be YouTubers, uh, they may be 
um, the airbox containers that makes the metadata steward. So basically by putting them into the place of the media and the data steward, they then can understand how does it like to feel to, to make moral choices about these things. So instead of banning their use of these social media and things like that, we make sure that they, as early as possible, understand the negative external analysis and do it in a more healthy way, a more healthy relationship uh, with those tech companies. And it's not a perfect answer because Facebook and Google and so on, they're not having these companies. There's limits of what we can do. <laughs> but but uh, I think um, in particular, we are making everybody aware of the negative externalities by way of a very popular film that I encourage you to uh, to see uh, when it airs on HBO Asia. Um, it is a publicly funded uh, TV series of 10 uh, installments called The World Between Us, or Woman You Are the Judy. And it very clearly shows how the negative externalities of popular media, of social media, of how media frame things, of how media may may uh, reformulate itself, how the viewer actually has the, the uh, determination if they do it for collective action and things like that. So it's a really good media literacy tool, but that doubles as a 95% approval rate at IMDb uh, TV series that is extremely popular here and is probably funded by public money. So I think at the end of it, media literacy and curriculum is really the solution. But uh, we really need to call out those negative externalities from the multinational companies. Thank you very much. So, yes, here's. Okay. So, so that's the other quote. I just wanted to say. <laughs> Once you install it, your Facebook wall becomes uh, a random quote every day. Is there any public particip participation by Taiwanese citizens in the evaluation and judging of the innovative ideas produced by the teams in the hackathon? Uh, uh, yeah, that's what I think earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And any Taiwanese national or people with a residence certificate, they can uh, register and get 99 points. And, and that's where the quadratic voting comes to place. And we have more than 2,000 people voting. And, and so yeah, I, I really think this uh, QB, because we have other public voting before, in terms of special budgeting and so on, but people tend to just vote on one thing and forget about the rest. But now because of Q QB, we see a much more nuanced strategy voting. And because of that, I think this year's cohort is of a higher quality than the last year's one. So I think that's the main thing. Of course, you can also volunteer as a team member to any of those 20 teams. And we do get people like 10 people or so uh, who are just coming out of nowhere that says, I really like this idea and enjoy those uh, these things. Uh, and we also get like five different companies joining. Yeah. Other questions? I have like 15 minutes.